15 minutes ago, uh, who are both senior admissions officials from uh, two of the world-class schools that offer incredible MBA experiences, London Business School and NCAD. And they'll be sharing their insider perspective. And these are two people who sat in the admissions committee meetings to discuss applicants, to read those god-awful applications, and to render a decision on whether or not you fit or you didn't fit into their class. So just a few uh, quick words about Fortuna Admissions uh, before we introduce the panel. Uh, it was started four years ago uh, by the former directors of admissions, uh, sort of a, like a dream team of former adcoms. Uh, they've been gatekeepers at more than a dozen of the top business schools in the world. So they really know uh, the process of MBA admissions inside and out. So these were the folks who basically make all the decisions, they read all the files, uh, and they sit around in the room, and I've, I've done this myself because I've had the pleasure of being a fly on the wall in a couple of uh, different schools to see exactly how uh, the admissions committee debates and discusses candidates. So I think you'd find no other admissions coaching team more qualified given uh, that experience. And tonight we have two members of the team, uh, two terrific people, Caroline Diarte Edwards, who I've known now for quite a few years. Yeah. Caroline is joining, uh, joining us from uh, beautiful Vermont in the United States. Uh, although it's not the fall season there, which is the best time to be in Vermont, uh, it's a pretty good time to be in Vermont right now. It's very and nice. And Caroline was Director of Admissions, Marketing, and Financial Aid at NCON uh, from 2005 to 2012, That's right. uh, which is a good long spell, meaning she, she basically crafted uh, quite a few classes and uh, had a big hand in entering thousands upon thousands of NCOD MBAs. She shaped much of the school's admissions policy and no surprise she has an MBA from NCOD herself. She completed her undergraduate studies at the University of Cambridge in UK. I'm very impressed with that, I have to tell you. <laughs> uh, she has also worked as a management consultant uh, and a development officer for the International Finance Corporation. And let me just add that she is an incredibly great and gracious person and a marvelous cook. <laughs> I've had the pleasure of having dinner at her homes in Indiana as well as uh, in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, she has a great, fun-loving husband and wonderful children to Thank boot. Thank you very much. <laughs> And then we have, uh, from the UK, Emma Bond, who was a senior manager at London Business School with responsibility for full-time MBA admissions. She stays in close contact with the school and brings a real unique breadth of knowledge and insight into the admissions process, as well as other aspects of the MBA program, including recruiters, selection, and the entire MBA experience, because you can't actually have a senior role in an admissions office without really having a full knowledge of the programming and what goes into it. Uh, and I might add, uh, she worked at one of the world famous consulting firms, uh, BCG, that's Boston Consulting Group, as a European recruitment manager. So um, welcome to the two of you. Now let's just take a quick look at the agenda, give you an overview of what we hope to cover today. Uh, we want to talk about what's new this season in admissions at these two schools. What are they actually looking for? How can candidates stand out in the applicant pool, which is really especially important because as most of you who are in the game know, the vast majority of people who apply to a business school are fully qualified to attend and succeed, but only a small fraction of them ever get in. So there are often subtle um, issues that come up that actually an admissions consultant can be quite helpful in identifying and preventing. So we'll talk about the common mistakes that applicants made, what's a good timeline for application planning, uh, and ultimately we're going to finish uh, with a Q&A where you get to ask some of your questions. Now just a few housekeeping matters before we get into this. Number one, make sure you're mooted for the best audio quality. 
if you can't hear us or you're having sound issues, uh, we do suggest you use a headset or you dial in. The number is on your confirmation page for the webinar. Uh, we have a facilitator or an orchestrator uh, in the background who you can't see. Her name is Melissa Jones. She's up in Toronto, I believe, today. Mm -hmm. Melissa is fantastic and she can help you in any way possible. Uh, we'll, have, we'll try to leave like 15 minutes at the end for your Q&A. You can type your questions at any time into the questions box on the control panel on the right side of your screen and we'll answer as many of these questions as we can in the last 15 minutes. Melissa will help us sort through the questions uh, and make sure they're more generic and more relevant to the entire uh, audience as opposed to being super specific. I know many of you would want to have specific questions that relate directly to you. If we think the questions aren't going to be helpful to the entire audience, we might pass on them. In fact, I uh, have an offer at the end of the <clears throat> event today to contact Fortuna and get a free consultation, which I would urge you to do uh, because that's where you can get some specific questions answered um, by the experts at Fortuna. So let's start with Emma in London where, well actually you're outside London, it's very hot there today. We can see the glow in your face because the air conditioning obviously is not working. Thank you. So Emma, Emma. <laughs> what, what were the things that you were really looking for at LBS and, and what, what really stands out for you? So uh, thanks John, um, yes it is pretty warm here but I'm delighted to be on tonight. Um, I think that there are a number of qualities that are generic um, across many of the top business schools. So a number of things that you know all sort of admissions committees are looking for throughout the selection process. And those are the things that you'd expect like um, standout leadership skills, uh, the ability to think strategically and to solve problems, um, to make you know tough decisions quickly and well. Um, and then in addition to those kind of sort of more generic um, qualities, at LBS we were specifically looking for somebody with a very global profile um, and that could be, that could range a number of areas, that could be somebody who had lived and worked abroad you know, in a number of different countries, um, that could be somebody who had been educated um, on a fairly international level and sort of attended school or university in different countries around the world. Or it could be uh, on a slightly smaller scale, somebody who was currently in a role that you know they're working with a number of international clients on a sort of fairly daily basis. Um, so in addition to that, um, particularly one thing I think is very specific to LBS is the fact that we we look, used to look and they still look for people who have a very collegial nature. So mm. the study groups that um, the school operates, teams of six or seven people from different nationalities, different functional or sector backgrounds you need to really be able to bring a very collegial spirit to working in those teams and to making them you know successful because they are such a they do cover such a broad range of, of people um, and a broad range of cultures. Um, more and more we were seeking and they still are seeking people who have a very strong entrepreneurial spirit who like to perhaps strike a slightly different path than the banking or consulting or you know the usual sort of typical MBA um, post MBA goals. And then I think finally LBS is very keen to get people in who want to make an impact, who want to make a difference and that's, that's part of their um, kind of their real ethos. It's people who will make an impact and that can be either professionally sort of out in the real world or it can be just on campus when they arrive on the school you know and how much they're going to get involved, what are they going to contribute, how are they going to sit in the class and interact and what, what events are they going to Organized. You know, are they going to get involved in MBAT and all the big sporting functions? So I think those are probably the key things that LBS is, is still looking to attract. And I should probably point out, I think there's the most important difference <clears throat> and the most important commonality among these two schools are the commonality, let's do with that, uh, is the diversity uh, of the international um, applicant pool and, and student. I mean, there are few schools in the world uh, that offer the kind of quality and international diversity as NCI and London Business School. I think, I think that more than anything else, that, that is a true differentiator for these two schools. 
And then the, 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 um, the biggest difference is NCIOT has a 10-month accelerated MBA program. Mm -hmm. London Business School has a more traditional U.S. type of uh, two-year experience. And when we say two years, uh, we kind of really mean, what is it, 20 months really? It's, they have three exit points. So, yeah, traditionally two years, but then you can uh, graduate 15, 18, 21 months. So, yeah. Two years, give but, or take. So there is some flexibility in there in the program to uh, speed it up or to linger. I know the London Business School students that I've met uh, love to take the longer course because they love it so much. They love the ME experience so much. And what you do find in many schools, frankly, is that um, they want more because they loved it. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure that's true at NCIOT. You know, when then those 10 months are over and you blink your eyes, you say to yourself, my God, I wish this could last forever. <laughs> yeah, because it's time true. goes very quickly. It's yeah, true. and a great MBA experience brings you uh, together with people, man-to-man, uh, -man, woman to woman, among the best people you'll ever meet in your life. That's yeah. absolutely true. Now, Caroline, one of the really interesting things uh, that NCIOT has now introduced is a video component. Why, do, why have they done that? And tell us why we shouldn't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, um, so NCL introduced this really uh, with the aim of having an opportunity to observe the candidates directly. Um, otherwise, the elements that the school has on which, on which to base their decision, uh, they have the, the written application, of course, the recommendations, um, the, the test results, and then um, the interview reports from the alumni. So. Um, all of INSEAD's interviews are conducted by alumni. Typically, candidates will meet with, with two alumni in, the, in their hometown. Um, and sometimes um, it's useful for the school to get the opportunity to observe a candidate directly. Um, for example, uh, sometimes the school will get conflicting interview reports from, from two different alumni. And then it can be difficult for the school to decide, OK, so you know, who's report do we give um, you know mo mo the most credit in, in the in the evaluation process who do we believe if they're saying very really different things about the candidate that that may occasionally happen um, and also sometimes candidates aren't um, able to express themselves um, brilliantly on paper and, and, and present their story so well in a written format but if they're given the opportunity to present themselves live then they may do a much better job at, at getting their case across um, so, so it's. Uh, I think you know it's a really interesting experiment for the school. I think um, the file readers will appreciate the opportunity to have you know additional data point, additional way of um, engaging with the candidate and understanding them. Um, in terms of how it will work, so the school will send out the video questions after the candidate has submitted their application. Um, so they haven't yet released the video questions. They've said that this, this school will, will send out four video questions um, to the candidate and they will have a week to respond after they get those questions. And so they can log on to video platform, record their responses, uh, and then submit it to the school. In parallel, the school has dropped one of the essay questions. Um, so INSEAD is known for having one of the uh, longest applications of all the top schools, and I have to uh, take some of the blame for that myself, I'm afraid. Um, but they um, they have uh, they had a question on an experience of cultural diversity where candidates were asked to write about a, an experience when they had been um, faced with uh, a situation of, of cultural diversity. So often candidates would write about an experience in another country. So they've taken that essay out, and I um, and, and likely they will be asking candidates uh, something along those lines in the video questions. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see something about international experience in the video questions and also potentially something about um, motivation for applying to INSEAD um, because that is not something that's addressed in the written application anymore either. Right. And if, if you had to say what the key major differences are between NCAD and London Business School and the M7, the so-called, you know, uh, magical yeah. seven, magnificent seven yeah. uh, schools. And this goes way back when <clears throat> the world was different. So yeah. these M7 schools, which include Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, Chicago, Kellogg, MIT, Sloan. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, it, you know, this, this M7 idea was formed uh, at a time when MBA education was very U.S. centric and there weren't a lot of international options. And the international options yeah. weren't nearly as good as they are today. Yeah. So what, what, are, what are the basic differences? 
Well, the differences in terms of the admissions criteria mainly revolve around the international experience. Uh, as Emma said, you know, that's a very important part of what the admissions committee at either INSEAD or London Business School will be looking for. Um, otherwise, um, you know, for both schools, academic background, professional experience, and then also generally fit with the school community will be very important for both INSEAD and London Business School, um, as, as it is for the, um, for the top US schools. I mean, otherwise, in terms of experience for the student, uh, again, the main difference is being part of a very international community. Um, so, you know, at Indian London Business School, there's no dominant culture, which creates a very different environment in the classroom. Um, and I think, you know, it can be a very challenging environment for, for some people because you, you have a lot of different perspectives being brought to bear on a discussion. Um, and so, you know, that creates a very rich learning environment. Um, which you know really opens people's minds in a way that might not otherwise happen if they were in um, you know a classroom with less diversity. So you know I think that diversity really has a big impact on on what you learn and how you learn, and also um, you know provides a platform to international opportunities that candidates might not otherwise have as well. Right. And Emma, what what impact do you think Brexit is going to have on the UK business schools? Because you know, one of the reasons why, obviously, most um, candidates go to business school is either to uh, enhance one's career or to change a career uh, to the extent, extent that um, the UK is sort of going off on its own out of the European Union orbit. Will that make it more difficult for people to actually land the job in Europe? Well, it's something that Caroline and I have been discussing a bit over email recently. We've both been sort of watching very eagerly to see yeah, to see what was happening in the referendum and then uh, and then afterwards and and obviously you know anybody who's been watching the international news knows that things are still in a bit of a state of flux here at the moment. Um, I know from talking to people at the the main business schools here in the UK that they are also watching the scene very carefully at the moment. Um, I don't think there's any great panic at the moment really. Um, you know, in terms of LBS, it's a very globally focused school. So whilst it may have to adjust its marketing strategy slightly in terms of, you know, wording like the gateway to Europe, they may want to just think about slightly. Um, you know, it has such a, a global pool of students coming in and a global platform in terms of its spread across programs. So they have programs in the Middle East and Asia, um, you know, in connection with Colombia, for example, in New York. So I think... Um, I don't think people should be frightened of applying to the school on, on that, in that respect. Um, and certainly with LBS, if there is an issue in terms of um, you know, the job market in London tightening ever so slightly, I don't think it's likely to affect um, LBS specifically because the brand is strong. And it's the same, same thing that happens whenever the job market shrinks slightly, is that the top schools still manage to come out you know, doing pretty well. Um, and then. The other thing, obviously, is that if you are looking at a £70,000 degree, which is what it costs now for the, the LBS program, it's going to be quite a lot cheaper for you <laughs> for the next few years at least. So I think if anybody's looking at LBS and, and sort of finding the cost of living in London a bit daunting, that might be a, a very positive take on it. And, and the and truth is, wow. uh, there's so much uncertainty here that we really don't know how this is going to play out. It could very well be that it will never happen. I mean, you just don't know, really. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, very much. I might also point out that you know when visa restrictions occurred in the UK, there was um, all this. Oh my God, the sky is falling on the British uh, business schools. It didn't happen. Mm. No, and you know you only have to look at LBS, which has the current class as a ninety-two percent international, you know, group in there. So. It, there, there might be slightly more red tape, but no, there's no problem. And, and the school is so good at, at facilitating um, international students coming in. They're so used to it. It's not going to make mm -hmm. any difference in that respect. You know, it might take a couple of days longer, perhaps. We don't know yet. But it is a wait and see. But I don't think it should be putting anybody off by any means. Which I, I should point out that, you know, something that's often not said but needs to be said is that really the dirty little secret of all the great business schools in the world is how they've invested in the infrastructure of a degree. And what, what I mean by that is uh, they've over-invested compared to other colleges and other departments 
in making sure that people have a spectacular experience, and that relates to outcomes as well. There is no other school on a university campus that does a better job of connecting its students with employers, mm. period, none. Uh, this is why in the United States law schools are in such severe decline and total chaos, because they haven't done the sort of nitty-gritty back, uh, backroom investments mm -hmm. <laughs> that are necessary to make um, tremendous value come out of the degree. Mm. So here, here's a problem uh, that both of you confront, I'm sure, with so many of your clients, and that is a common issue uh, at any good school where there is an overabundance of terrific applicants, and that is this. How do you stand out from the pile? I mean, basically, if you're an investment banker or you're a consultant or you're someone with a technical background, an engineer who's done software development in India or elsewhere, and there are so many of you in that pile, how do you kind of stand out and make yourself known and visible to the admissions folks uh, in a way that gets you an invite? Mm, sure, yes, the million dollar question. Uh, <laughs> Well, I would say that you know, if you are, um, if you do have a background that is a common profile for business school, then you need to do a very honest assessment of of where you stand and um, and think about you know what will the school like about your profile and what weaknesses you may have. I mean, for INSEAD, as we said, you know, they're looking for um, a strong academic background, they're looking at professional experience, they're looking at international experience, and they're looking at fit for INSEAD. And you know, if you have a, a very common profile, you really need to be very solid across all of those criteria. If there's a major weakness there in any of those areas, then it's going to be very tough for you because there'll be other candidates who you know are able to shine um, across all dimensions. Um, for some candidates, that may mean that, um, for example, perhaps they need to get some more work experience or get some more international experience before applying uh, applying to the school, um, and then. If the candidate is strong across all, all of those dimensions, then they need to go one step further and figure out, well, on which of those dimensions can I really stand out versus the other candidates? So there may be some elements of the profile that you know, can really help to differentiate them. So perhaps they've um, done a very interesting international assignment or worked in a you know, particularly challenging country. Um, or perhaps they um, have, a, have a side business, a, a startup that they're working on at, at the weekends um, that's you know, nothing to do with their day job, but it's just you know, a, a startup side interest. Um, it might be that um, their family has a business, and from a young age they um, you know, listen to dinner table conversation about you know, how, did, how did the sales go today, um, you know, how are we going to deal with this is, issue, how are we going to tackle the you know, the downturn in the economy and that they were sort of exposed to that, that environment from an early age and that may have sort of shaped um, how they think and, and the direction that they've taken. So um, I think candidates need to sort of take a step back and take stock and think about, um, you know, how am I different from my peer group and how can I build that into a compelling story to present to business school. And, you know, in that reflection process, it can also be very helpful to get someone else um, to to help you take stock because sometimes you know when you're looking at your own profile and we see that with our clients it could be hard for an individual to see um, you know what is it about my story that a business school will particularly like um, you know I've worked with clients where um, you know there's been some element in their profile that was very compelling for business school and they hadn't thought of showcasing that so for example I worked with um, a guy who was working for the Canadian government and he had not studied or worked outside of Canada and he was applying to INSEAD and this was potentially going to be an issue because it looked like he didn't have any international experience. But he was working in, in um, a department where he was dealing with a lot of diplomats at a very international level um, and at a very senior level. So, um, so that was very interesting experience and very different from what other candidates might bring. Um, so I think that opportunity to you know get some feedback from someone else on 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 your profile can be very useful, particularly for those types of candidates where where they have a common profile. And something else I would say for INSEAD is that it is a big program. So um, the school is taking in about 500 students twice a year, so a thousand students a year. Um, so they're not only looking for you know one management consultant from the UK or one. Um, 
one IT engineer from India that they you know ha they have the capacity to be flexible and so um, they don't have strict um, uh, quotas for um, you know individual profiles um, to the same extent that some of the smaller programs um, may have so if they're you know if you're a really strong candidate I wouldn't worry too much about the competition just think about you know how can you really put your best foot forward and sometimes you can differentiate yourself through your extracurriculars, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and it's often an overlooked area. Um, uh, candidates um, sometimes focus too heavily in their applications on, you know, the academic ability and the professional experience. I mean, those elements are very important. Um, but you know, the, the school really values the extracurricular profile. And um, at least for, for INSEAD, that fits into the evaluation of what the school calls fit for INSEADs, which is one of the four key pillars that the school uses to evaluate all candidates. So as part of the, uh, the assessment of the candidates you know, fit for INSEAD, they will be looking at the candidate's extracurricular profile. And they see that as evidence of you know, whether the, the candidate is someone who likes to get involved in, in um, other activities beyond school and work because they, they want to attract students who are really going to get involved in, in the life of the community and be active members of the school, um, both while they're at the school and then, um, and then as alumni, of course, as well. So um, the extracurriculars can, can really be very useful. And it's an opportunity to show that, um, that you've also taken leadership. You know, extracurriculars can be a great way, especially for young people at a very early stage in their career and therefore may not have, have had a lot of management or leadership responsibility in a formal setting. Um, extracurriculars can be a great way to show that um, you know, you've taken initiative, you've been able to step up, you've led a team, perhaps in sports or volunteering um, capacity, um, and, and that you've, you, know, you, you have sought that experience um, proactively. And, and you will get a lot of credit that, for that from the admissions committee. Right. Now, Emma, I'm always amazed at how one of the jobs of an admissions committee, an admissions director, is to craft the ideal class. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I wonder what that means, really. Does it mean that you're literally choosing uh, between and among an investment banker and an and a, a IT engineer or uh, a strategy consultant and someone who's been in marketing at a consumer products company? What, is it, what does it really mean? What does it, what does it mean for quotas? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that no school wants too many IT engineers in the classroom, too many management consultants, too many bankers, too many military people, too many of anything because you want the right mix, but what does it all mean? Well, I think um, Caroline sort of touched on this earlier on when she was talking about building a platform for the best learning experience. So, you know, um, no school so the NCAD and LBS, we don't have quotas, but what we want to end up with with our 420 or 500 students or however many we're taking into the class is a very balanced profile um, because, you know, every adcom believes that the more variety and diversity that you can bring into the class profile, the better the learning experience. It allows, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a class that is mixed across the sectors and across the functions, then when you're in these study groups or when you're in a lecture situation and you have somebody that can talk knowledge knowledge about, you know, up to oil and gas right. for somebody who's interested in that sector, but they were initially, you know, coming through with a law degree and they've worked in a, in a magic circle law firm in London, say, you know, it gives a much more realistic perspective and, and a deeper understanding of, of, you know, different styles of, of working, of organizations and cultures. So I mean, from my experience, when I was on the Adcom LBS, building that class profile was one of the most exciting things. It's difficult, <laughs> um, you know, there's no question about it, but making sure that you end up with a class um, that, you know, shows that diversity that LBS is famous for was a really kind of quite a buzzy thing. I think um, it's a good, good opportunity to bust the myth, which still exists, that LBS is just a finance school because it very definitively isn't. Um, and over the time that I was there, you know, it moved from a class that was sort of fish, 35 percent bankers and people from the finance sector. They started taking a lot more consultants. But then, you know, now there are medics, there are lawyers, there are people from the military, there are people who, you know, actors. We've had their professional tennis players, opera singers, people that a lot of not not for profit. You know, that's taken off a lot. 
and then obviously there's entrepreneurs who come in every year. Um, so it's it's all about, you know, to a certain extent, yes, if you come from an overrepresented group, then you are going to go up against um, other candidates who have a similar profile to you. But I would always urge candidates to try not to think too hard about that and to concentrate more about putting together absolutely the best possible application that they can, um, you know, which means taking the time for self-reflection, presenting a very compelling backstory so that, you know, the person on the adcom finds out who you are, what you're about, um, why LBS is the right school for you, you know, why you need to do an MBA now, and then also making the personality shine. And that again goes back to what Caroline's just been talking about, which is all the extracurricular stuff, you know, the sports the Toastmasters, the, the charity work, the, the drama, the, what it, the whatever you might happen to do, um, the organisational skills that you show for being involved in committees or, you know, leading events or, or anything, give, give the ADCOM a chance to know you as a person, not just a, you know, a very two-dimensional piece of paper, because it's great when you get through to the interview stage and then you're able to do that, you know, with more... Um, more ease, but to start with, we are just reading, you know, a file, or perhaps now, like you said, a video, you know, but it, it's a very difficult cut to make, and yeah, it's all about getting the best people from across a very wide variety of areas. So, so five days ago, Harvard Business School uh, released its preliminary profile of the incoming class. <clears throat> I bring this up because, to me, it's a natural follow to the quota question I asked you, because every year, what those profiles show is that there's, there's amazing consistency in the percentage of people from consulting backgrounds, finance backgrounds, tech backgrounds, military backgrounds, uh, the percentage of international uh, enrolled students at 35%, just as exactly as it was last year. In other words, what it, it makes you really believe there are, in fact, quotas. Mm. that you want a certain percentage of this kind of person, a certain percentage of that kind of person. Are there quotas in admissions to get that diverse class? Well, so I think um, at some schools, I mean, it's, it's, it, there's always a trade-off between um, you know, trying to juggle, making sure that you get the best of the class versus making sure that you have the most diverse class. Um, and I mean, speaking from my experience at INSEAD, um, so we would not have quotas, but, um, and, you know, we would not be trying to sort of make sure that we had the same, you know, consistent number of people coming from consulting and consistent number of people coming from finance, or, you know, a certain percentage of entrepreneurs. It's largely also a function of the applicant pool. Um, so actually, it's quite surprising that given that the school is not sort of carefully controlling. We have, you know, X number of places for, um, uh, you know, X military. We have X number of places for entrepreneurs. We have X number of places for, um, you know, family business uh, um, backgrounds from Asia or whatever it may be. Actually, there is some consistency over time, and it does gradually evolve. Uh, but there aren't any dramatic changes year by year in the makeup of the applicant pool. Um, so I think the consistency that you're seeing in uh, the statistics of, of the class, um, and, and you know, I'm, I'm sure it will be, you know, you don't see dramatic changes in other schools either because there aren't, uh, you know, the, the changes in the applicant pool happen quite slowly over time. Right. Um, and, and so the school may be giving, um, you know, it's going to be harder for some profiles than for others for sure. You know, if you, as we said, if you're, you are part of an overrepresented pool, um, then you know the level of competition will frankly be be higher, um, and schools will be looking out for specific profiles, right? So if you have a very unusual profile, it's absolutely true that you have a better chance of getting into any of these top schools. Um, but they're not, at least at Insia, we wouldn't be saying you know we have X number of places for this profile, and once we've hit that point, then everyone else, um, you know, is, is cut out, is eliminated. Um, but you know, the, the, it, it's um, you know that's a big challenge for the admissions committee is trying to sort of manage the diversity of the class and sort of maximise both quality and diversity with with the applicant pool that they have. Mm -hmm. So, Caroline, let me ask you about the most one of the most anxiety-producing things that occur to applicants to to really good business schools, 
um, they don't get accepted and they don't get rejected, they get put on the dreaded right. wait list. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Why, why do schools have wait lists? And how large are they? And, and yeah. what do you do if you get stuck on one? Yeah, no, it is very tough, and the schools appreciate that. You know, it's a very difficult situation for candidates to be in. You know, they admissions officers are human too, and they realise that it's uh, you know very tough for candidates to be left in a in a limbo situation, and as you say, often for several months. So, and the reason that schools waitlist is because um, you know that they have to manage the number of people who are accepted the program, and and they never, you never know in advance exactly what your yield will be. So, you know, the yield is the, the number of people who, are, who accept the offer and pay their deposit versus the number of people who are accepted at the school. Um, and so, you know, the admissions committee is responsible for making sure that, you know, they fill the classroom and they don't overfill it and they don't underfill it. Um, so, you know, you can get big trouble for, for ending up with too many students or not, or not enough students. <laughs> So, so they use the wait list to manage that buffer, um, and also, I mean, a school like INSEAD will use the wait list to manage the diversity of the class as well. Um, so, uh, you know, if they see that there's, uh, you know, a certain population in the applicant pool that is overrepresented or underrepresented, you know, that will that will also influence how they use the wait list and and to whom they will release places over time. Um, so. The school and the school is also, you know, anticipating what will happen in later rounds. So in round one, you know, the school doesn't know how many applications they're going to get in round two, round three, round four. Right. Um, so you know, they're going to need to wait list some people because they have to wait and see what, uh, you know, volume of applications, what quality of applications they will get coming through later on. So so that buffer is really, you know, a very useful tool for the admissions office. Um, I mean, they understand that it is it's very tough position for candidates to be in, so they try not to waitlist too many people. Um, and also, I mean, what we would do at INSEAD is, you know, if it became apparent that we had too many people on the waitlist and some of them would never be admitted, then we would tell them as soon as we could, right? You don't want to leave someone on the waitlist for six months if you could have released them um, after two months and told them, um, you know, we're not going to be able to offer you a place. Um, sure. So they, they try to keep people informed. Uh, if a place does become available, you know they communicate it as quickly as possible to to the candidate. Um, but you know, in reality, it can go on for some time. Um, you know, sometimes waitlist positions will be released. You know, even up to you know two weeks, ten days um, before the, the the program starts. Um, so so it is difficult. I mean, I would say to waitlisted candidates, you know, keep in touch with the school. Um, just touch base with the school every few weeks, maybe every month. Don't be you know, don't get in contact too much because there are always a handful of waitlisted candidates that you know become a bit of a pest in the admissions office and get a bad reputation for always being on the phone. So you don't want to get get that reputation. But um, you know, do keep the school updated and, and do stay on the radar screen because um, you know the school also wants to know on the waitlisted are still willing to take a place if they make them an offer. Um, so uh, I don't know Emma, how different it was at, at London Business School. No, I think I think yeah, it's very similar really. Um, it's not a pleasant situation for people. You know, you spend a lot of time when you're on the adcom managing sort of expectations of people, and LBS always have very firm deadlines where they will communicate with people. You know, throughout the, the waitlist um, time, you know what the situation is. And as Caroline said, if there are people who clearly aren't going to be offered, then they will be removed and, and let go from the process. Um, I think one point that it's worth making is just in terms of quality control. Um, certainly when I was at LBS, what we used to see is that round one and round two, which the deadlines are still uh, October and early January, you used to get a, a lot of candidates, but you also often used to get candidates who were perhaps of higher quality, not across the board, but you'd get a, a large percentage of high quality candidates because they were people who'd thought really carefully and done their research and spent the previous summer, you know, this whole period of time planning their application and, and researching the schools and doing all the right steps. Um, and then sort of in the later rounds three and four, and I, I, do, I assume and said would be similar, um, sometimes there's a quality drop off because either people are rushing and they don't project, you know, the best picture of themselves, or sometimes it is just a pure quality thing where 
people who've been rejected from the US schools sort of suddenly do a last minute kind of dive at perhaps, you know, LBS and NCA because right. they've still got deadlines open, whereas a lot of the US schools are closed by then. So it's also used in, in that kind of function as well. Yeah. Great. Let's go to the common pitfalls and mistakes that applicants make. So Emma, you've reviewed thousands of applications and you've interviewed thousands of people who want to get into London Business School. So tell me, what are the most common things that drive you crazy? Okay. Aside from people perhaps using the word HBS or Wharton in an LBS application, which we've all had. Um, no. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> Really, that one's got to go straight away. Um, I think there are probably three quite big mistakes that, that I think people make in the applications and in the interviews. Um, the first is research. You know, people who don't take the time to research the school thoroughly. Um, I think all adcoms are a bit precious about their own schools. You know, you all think you've got the best program. You all think you've got the best experience to offer. You know, that's why you do the job. That's why it's easy to do the job if you're working at a great school. Um, but, you know, not taking the time to research and presenting generic essays and not really understanding the program or the culture, the fit of the school that you're applying to, um, you know, that's, that's a real no-no because there's no excuse these days for not doing your research. It's all out there. You just have to take the time to do it. So that would be the fifth one, you know, not demonstrating a, a real understanding of the program that you're applying to. Um, the second one is not knowing yourself properly, and I think Caroline touched on this a little bit earlier. You know, you can't spend enough time really thinking about your career path, you know, what steps you've taken that have got you to where you are now, you know, why at this point in your career you really want to take on an MBA, um, and thinking about your own skills and strengths, you know, what are you offering this program, what are you going to this adcom to say, you know, this is what I'm good at, this is what I'm going to do for you when I get into your class, and when I'm a, a, a graduate, an alumnus, this is what I'm going to go out and do. You know, so I think um, people who don't self-reflect, and and I do literally remember sitting, reading applications, and you know, from people who didn't know themselves and therefore couldn't put their own story across. And you do think, well, if you haven't taken the time to think this through and given us a, you know, really structured, clear idea of where you're going, how on earth are we supposed to know that? An MBA is not a magic pill. You know, people have to work before they get in. They have to work on the program and they have to continue working. It's it's a management process. Um, and then the last thing would be, for me, it's it's a lack of passion that you see, or that you, you know, a passion that you don't see in applications. Um, mm. And again, you know, I know Caroline loves INSEAD, I love LBS, um, I have a, you know, a long association, but it's 2001 that I started working there. Um, I have family members that have been there, and I, and I love the school. So it's very depressing really to get an application from somebody that is otherwise a really good candidate but they just don't kind of show any real enthusiasm or drive or passion for, for what the school has to offer because then you just think well they might look great on paper, their stats might be great, you know they might have the world's best GMAT, best GPA, have been a blue chip firm, look like they're going to go fly but are they going to be an LBS brand ambassador, are they going to take the school forward and help help grow it in the future. So I think those three things for me are probably the, the things that used to bug me the most anyway. Yeah. Good, good points. And I should remind everyone in the audience that we did a video with Caroline and her colleague Judith Federa of uh, Wharton fame on this very topic, common mistakes people make. And we also did a video, and you can find it on the website, boatsandquants.com, uh, on the next question, which is going to be the last question we uh, we uh, throw to the two panelists before we open it up uh, to everyone, which is this. If you are planning to apply to a business school, and a highly, highly selective one, particularly in the coming admission season, what's, what's the timeline that you should be, have in mind? Um, and we have a great video on this, and I recall that both you and Judith, Caroline, yeah. suggested that the process should probably begin a year before you actually apply. But for those who are, are in the in the game now yes, and want to yeah. apply in the first or second round, what should they be thinking about? What should they be doing? Yes. Yeah, well, um, the, the time to act is now. So, you know, for candidates who are targeting the coming season, 
um, there aren't so many weeks between um, now and the, and the round one applications. Um, and you know what we see is that candidates typically need at least six weeks to really um, do a, a great application and do a really you know the best possible job at representing themselves in the written application. Um, so you know at this stage you're targeting round one. Hopefully you've already got the GMAT under your belt. If you haven't, then you know it's probably worth spending a bit of time on that first, and then perhaps thinking about round two for your applications. Um, right. And um, Melissa, if you could bring up the slide, please, on, on the, um, the roadmap. If you could share your screen on that. I think Melissa will throw up a slide that sort of gives a, a, a bit of structure around this. Oh, um, but, um, and, and what I would say is that, I mean, we, we have, you know, candidates do get admitted who, um, you know, work on the application over quite a collapsed time frame. Um, but what we see is that if you're able to invest significant time and effort in the, um, in the initial reflection process that Emma talked about, um, then you're able to get more out of the process overall and um, you know, really present a more thoughtful application. Um, so so we've got some um, points on the screen about the, you know, the things that you need, the steps that you need to be going through. Uh, and what I would say is you know, don't dive in straight away to, to writing your application. First of all, you need to, as we said, you know, take a step back, back um, take stock, think about uh, you know your profile overall. What your strengths and weaknesses are. What um, could really you know be effectively highlighted in your application that can help you stand out. Um, what potential concerns the school might have about your profile and how you could be proactive in mitigating that in your application. So all of that reflection process um, at the beginning is, is very important before you dive into. Um, to writing anything, and that's you know when we work with our clients, that's something we we invest a lot of effort in is is doing that analysis of their profile, um, you know, academic backgrounds, professional, all the professional experience, um, uh, extracurriculars, past and present, and just general life history. Because sometimes people have really interesting stories of um, you know having um, you know moved across continents uh, when they were a child and how that influenced. How they see the world and, and what they decided to do with their life. So you know, it, it, sometimes you have to really um, think quite deeply about your own life story and and you know what is relevant to pre present to business school and and you know how you can tell your personal story. Um, and then uh, what you know once you start working the application, I mean obviously there's um, there's a number of elements that you have to prepare. Um, Typically, the essays do quite, take quite a bit of time. As we said, you know, most candidates go through you know several iterations of the essays before yeah, before you know they've really got to the point where they've um, uh, you know really put their story across most effectively, and also thought about you know you've got to think about how the essays fit in the application overall because mm -hmm. there are several components, and each component um, the the resume, the application form, the essays, the the recommendation letters. Um, each of these, it's like pieces of a puzzle that fit together to build a picture overall. And so you shouldn't um, sort of, you know, address one in isolation. You've got to think about, you know, how all of these elements fit together um, to build the overall picture. Um, and in, in addition to those elements, you know, we also recommend that, um, you know, point four on the slide, uh, the, the social media aspect, you know, do just take stock of what you've got online. Now, increasingly, people have, you know, quite a large digital footprint, and just, you know, do a check, make sure what is out there about you that the ad comms could come across. Um, and then, no drunken the... photographs, right? <laughs> no, better, better to um, check your Facebook settings so that you know nothing <laughs> untoward may pop up on 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 a Google search. Um, and then it's difficult to read on the screen, but um, throughout the whole process, you need to be constantly sort of, you know, deepening your knowledge about the schools that you're applying to. Um, it, it's not sufficient to just sort of, you know, check out the rankings, read the school website, and then figure out where you're going to apply and take it from there. And uh, you need to be continually refining your knowledge of the school and learning about the program. Um, and as Emma said, you know, um, interact with the school. You, you need to reach out to the community if you can, if you can possibly get to campus. I mean, that is ideal. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, in Seattle London Business School, do a lot of events around the world that you may be able to attend, or you can attend an online event. Um, reach out to, um, to to the current students. Reach out to the the, the um, local alumni. 
um, you know, through LinkedIn research, you may, able, may be able to identify people who graduated through the, from the school who are in your extended network. Um, so, you know, keep working on that as well. Um, with, with INSEAD, um, you don't have to, for the time being, you don't have to put anything in the written application about why you're applying to INSEAD. And so sometimes um, candidates don't spend sufficient time on doing their research into the school. Um, but at the interview stage, it's very important to be able to convey um, you know, why you've applied to INSEAD and, and you know, how you've done your research and what interaction you've had with the school community. Um, so thinking about that really early on and, and building that into your overall timeline is, is very important. Okay, I want to go right to the questions because we have oh, a little more than 10 minutes left. The first question I think is a really good one. I don't know the answer to this. Uh, this is going to be for Caroline, uh, and then we will make sure that Emma is right next. Uh, it relates to NCAD. You have, you know, you have a few options um, that at NCAD that you wouldn't have at a lot of other schools. Number one, you have whether or not to go in the January or the August intake. Yeah. And what the difference between the two might be, and then you have this intriguing option to decide whether you want to start at the Singapore campus or the Fontainebleau campus. Yeah. How should an applicant think about those options, and what are the considerations that you should apply to them? Yes, yeah, very good question. Um, all right, so January intake um, versus the, um, the, the August intake, um, there's no difference in the level of competition. Sometimes candidates are wondering, you know, do more people apply for one class than the other? Well, in fact, more people do apply um, for the August-September intake than the January intake, but the yield is higher for the January intake. So in fact, um, the offer rate is the same. So the level of, therefore the level of competition is the same. Um, and it, you know, it's interesting that it's worked out like that. Um, I'm not sure if it was always like that at INSEAD, but you know, certainly for the seven years that I was admissions director, that, that was the case. So, um, there's, so there's no need to worry about you know, whether you have a better chance in one class versus the other. Um, so then you should think about you know, which, which format works best for you individually. Um, with a January intake, you have the opportunity to do an internship. Um, so there's an eight-week break um, in, in um, uh, June and July when you can do an internship. And, and so many students take that opportunity. And that can be really useful if you're doing um, quite a big career change. Um, so some candidates uh, you know, might prefer that option if they're making quite a big career change and they you know, want to take advantage of the internship opportunity. If you start later in the year, um, you graduate after 10 months without done, doing any internships. So um, I personally did the January intake. Um, I was looking to make a career switch into Asia and I spent the summer working in Singapore. And so that was great for me personally to get some experience of, um, of working um, in Southeast Asia and you know that that helped me with my job search. Um, then for the for the campuses, so on your application form you can either say that you want to start in Singapore, in Fontainebleau, or you don't mind and the school will allocate you to a campus. Um, when the admissions committee um, reviews your application, they can't see that information. So so the decision is completely blind of your campus choice. Wow. Uh, so this and the school has always done that from the start, from when they first introduced the Singapore campus, because they didn't want there to be any difference in the quality of the people admitted to either campus. So the, the admissions committee do not have access to that information. Um, so then the challenge for the admissions team behind the scenes is to engineer the class so that you have uh, you know the right number of people on both campuses and similar diversity. And so, in effect, what will happen, um, some people who, for example, said that they wanted to start in Fontainebleau may be, said, may be told, you know, we have a place for you, but, um, but it's in Singapore. So you can either accept the place in Singapore now, or you can go on the wait list for Fontainebleau. In most cases, people um, take the offer to start on the, on the other campus. <clears throat> right. Here's another really good question. I think it applies to a lot of candidates. We'll hand this over to Emma. Uh, how important is it to have worked for a brand name you know, company and have it on your resume uh, in admissions? Um, I think you know it's useful. There's there's no no getting around that. But if you have worked for a, a BCG or a Booz or a, 
sorry, a, a Bain or a McKinsey or if you've worked for you know, one of the major banks. Um, I think in those industries it can be helpful. Um, but simply because you know we you, you do read so many CVs as they come through and those names do come off the page at you quite readily. So you're usually aware that those companies have made a, a cut initially to bring their own you know people in. Um, and then of course if you're coming in from a blue chip consulting firm or something, a lot of them have already done their two years and it's part of their career progression and they've been very carefully selected by those firms you know, to do the MBA because a lot of them are sponsored and the firms aren't going to actually pay for somebody to do a, a long MBA program if they don't think that they're, you know, sort of academically and worth investing in. Um, having said that, and I think um, what we were talking about earlier, the diversity that both LBS and NCAC bring into that class means that, you know, there are so many industries represented that you can't possibly expect everybody to come in from you know, somewhere with a brand that you would recognise. Um, and, you know, quite often it's the people that come in from niche industries or, you know, little boutique consulting firms that have a more entrepreneurial mindset. People who've worked in startups often bring in a huge, you know, breadth of experience across all sorts of things, you know, across the marketing and the organisational behaviour and the finance, you know. So they're bringing in a completely different perspective than somebody who's worked for a multinational who may have had a very... Um, sort of discrete functional role. So I think, you know, whilst it can be um, useful sort of just in terms of getting yourself recognised, I don't think people who uh, people who haven't worked in those kind of institutions should should not be at all put off about applying. Mm. I think they just, um, you just, what you do need to do is be careful with your CV and that's one of the things that we work with people at Fortuna is to ensure that, you know, if you have a smaller company, Make sure that the admissions committee know what the company is all about. So you have to be careful to elaborate your own skill set, perhaps a little bit more than you might do if you come in come in from a from a McKinsey, because you know that's a bit more clear to somebody reading your file what you've actually been doing. Um, but no, you know, we have LBS takes in so many people from family business backgrounds. You know, for as I say, from startups, from smaller firms, and and it all adds to the to the learning experience in the classroom. So. So yeah, don't don't. I would say to anybody applying, don't worry if you don't have a big blue chip name on your CV. Hmm. Okay, here's another uh, question, and this kind of goes back to what you said earlier, both of you, in terms of the schools emphasizing international experience uh, in the applicant pool and really wanting that. What if you don't have any? What happens? Is there a way to offset the lack of international experience, or do you have no chance whatsoever at, at uh, LBS or NCAD? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that you don't have any chance at all. Um, I mean, the school will cut some slack, especially to candidates who, you know, might not have had the opportunity to get international experience. Um, so, for example, people in emerging markets might have not have had the resources to study or work abroad. Um, it's not an opportunity that everyone gets at a very young age. Uh, the school recognizes that. Um, but, um, you know, so what you can do uh, perhaps if you have experience of working uh, with an international team in an international firm, then you know it's very useful to address that in your application. And then also to convey in your application, uh, you know, why you want to be part of an international community, um, you know, what your motivation is, and how that's relevant to your future career. Uh, and then um, you know, also think about how you can demonstrate some of the qualities that the school will be looking for. Um, so that you can, you know, fit well in a very international environment. So, you know, flexibility, adaptability, um, being open-minded, um, you know, all of those characteristics are important so that, you know, you will um, flourish in a very international environment that can be quite challenging for some people who haven't had a lot of international exposure. And let me get another uh, question in here quickly from another uh, person in the audience. Is there any material difference between applying round one, round two at either of the, of the two schools that you both know very well? You mean just between, between round one and round two? Um, right. At LBS, no, not, not particularly. Um, there is a big bubble of applications in round two, but um, you know, the, the percentage of allocation of interviews and things tends to basically reflect um, the number of applications that come in. I think there is a big difference between applying in round one and round four. Um, because there's definitely a squeeze on places by that end of the application cycle. 
but I always say, you know, do the best application you can, don't rush it, and if you are a really good candidate, then it doesn't matter whether you apply in round one, two, three or four, you'll still get, you know, the chance to interview. But um, but between between round one and round two, no, not particularly. Yeah, I agree. Okay, last question. Is is it true that both NCR and LBS prefer more experienced candidates in the pool, uh, those with five or more years of experience? Well, so at NCR, the average is about five and a half years experience. I mean, the, but there's a range. So there'll be people in the program who have only two years experience. There'll be people who have 10, maybe even 12 years experience. So you know you don't have to have the average to be eligible to apply, um, but if you have less work experience, then you need to convey the quality of that experience and also you know show what you've achieved. It can be harder if you only have one or two years experience to really show what you're capable of. You know, someone with three or four years experience has probably progressed, perhaps had some management responsibility, and so you know it can be easier for those candidates um, to to really show their strengths and to shine in the application process. Um, I, w I would also say that you know at INSEAD it's a one-year program. It's very intensive. Having um, you know some really solid professional experience before you come is actually very valuable for your own learning experience because you're able to relate what you learn um, to the real world more easily than if you're sort of seeing it from a more theoretical ex perspective because you don't have a lot of real-world experience. So I would say um, you know for INSEAD, um, for most candidates you probably need three or four years work experience to get the most out of it, at least. Super. Uh, Emma, you were going to say something. I was going to say, LBS is similar. Um, I think, you know, I think the average is still around five years, but they're definitely interested in people with three or four years experience. And it, and it depends what, again, where you come from and what your field is. Um, I think in, at um, LBS, sorry, there are a number of programs across the portfolio, so they, they now have their Masters in Management, which is, you know, mm -hmm. the less experienced candidates, and then there are things like the Executive Programs and the Sloan Masters for people who are at the upper end. So, yeah, I think I think there is a, a program there to fit everybody, um, and it's more about the quality of your experience than, than particularly the length of time. Great. I want to let everyone know that if you have questions that we weren't able to get to, you can actually send them in and get an answer from the Fortuna team at info at fortunaadmissions.com. So the last thing I want to make uh, clear, first I want to thank both Caroline and Emma for a superb session. Uh, I think anyone who's uh, been with us in this past hour can tell how smart, intelligent, insightful and thoughtful both these two are about uh, MBA admissions in general and in particular at NCI and the London Business School. And I have to tell you that I meet a lot of MBA admission consultants in, our, in my job as a editor of Poets and Quants and Fortuna is way at the top of the game. Uh, and I think our session here actually showed it and proved it. Now if you want a free evaluation of your MBA candidacy, you can do so by contacting Fortuna. The email addresses um, and information is right on the slide in front of you. Take it down, uh, call them up, uh, get the free session. They're not going to hard sell you. <laughs> yeah, they'll probably sell you a little bit, let's face it. I mean, after all, that's part of this. But uh, you're going to get a truthful evaluation uh, yeah. from them, and it's going to be really helpful to you. So thank you, Caroline, in Vermont. Thank you, Emma, in uh, north of London. <laughs> I hope it cools down for you in the UK, both in terms of weather and in terms of Brexit. <laughs> and, <laughs> and thank all of you for attending. And incidentally, just one last uh, plug for Poets and Quants. You know, if you come to the site, Caroline, uh, Judith, and Matt Simons, uh, three of the principals of Fortuna, have authored a number of really helpful articles that appear on our site. Uh, if you want to find them, just go to Google, put in Poets and Quants, colon, and write in Caroline Diarte Edwards, Judith Hodera, or Matt Simons, M-A-T-T-S-Y-M-O-N-D-S, -T 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 and all of the stories that they've written for us providing great advice to applicants will pop up. Also check out the video. Uh, we, we did a series of three videos in, um, in the Bay Area with both Caroline and uh, Judith, and they are spectacular. 
a lot of information uh, and brought to you in an entertaining way. So thank you and good luck on your uh, journey to business school. Uh, I am a true advocate for this degree because it really pays off and even though schools uh, so easily toss off this notion that an MBA experience is transformative to your life. The truth is, it is, and it really will make a difference. So thank you for joining us.